welcome everyone to another episode of In the Strike Zone. Sorry for the hiatus schoolwork. Oh, it's a killer. I'm your host, as usual, Sean Grassi, and I'm joined this week by my good friend, Rory Burns Mullen. How you doing, Rory? I'm good, Sean. You know, it's great to be here. It's my first time on the show, and I'm, uh, I'm just excited. I'm, I'm glad to have you be on here. Yeah, it's a great time having new guests come into In the Strike Zone, because I know Flinny, who usually was on, loves being in the baseball scene, but it's nice to have new people come in for especially the different sports that we cover in basketball, hockey, and football. So let's get into it, shall we, in talking about the basketball playoffs as the NBA is heating up, and surprisingly, the Celtics, the number one seed overall in the Eastern Conference are down 2-0 to the eighth-seeded Chicago Bulls. What do you think about that, Rory? You know, Sean, I think it's just been really hard for the Celtics, being that Isaiah Thomas' sister has passed away. And, you know, it's a tragic event, and you feel bad for him, but it's just been a, a real detriment to the Celtics' game so far. And it's been really hard on him and I think the whole team. And I'm not saying that it, that really translates to the court, but I think they lost their fire and what they have really been about in the regular season. Yeah, as we all know that Isaiah Thomas did go into Seattle after the game two of the Bulls winning on that one. And they come back to actually do game three either tonight or tomorrow. And Isaiah Thomas should be back for that game. And that would be actually quite exciting to see how he handles himself now that all the grieving should be done. Granted, there's obviously going to be pain because we've all experienced some type of funeral. There's going to be a lingering pain, but at the same time, Isaiah Thomas is one of the best elite point guards who is a phenomenal athlete on top of it. So he knows how to set his mindset, and it'll be an interesting game three as we possibly see Boston turn themselves around and possibly go from here on out, go for the sweep, because that's the only option by the looks of it to actually get some momentum into this Boston Celtics team who somehow managed to outlast the Cleveland Cavaliers who are going, going up and now against the Indiana Pacers. And that's a surprising matchup too, wouldn't you say, Rory? Yes, I'd have to agree, Sean. You know, it's been very interesting here. You cannot turn off a Cavaliers game. They can be blowing the other team out and their defense is just so bad that it ends up being close in the end. And it's always exciting to watch, but if I were to bet on anybody, it would be the Cavaliers to make it to the NBA Finals. They are just too good of a team, and LeBron is the is the greatest player in the world. I, I can't say it any more like that, any better than that. But it's just it's incredible. I love watching them play, and I cannot turn them off because their defense is horrendous. Yeah, and it's actually quite amazing to looking at this in terms of what is actually going on in terms of this team. Considering LeBron has gotten all the shoes that he needs. But you see the two-sided coin here of LeBron has the same, has all the pieces that he wants in terms of getting the veteran three-pointers who know how to make the clutch shots and be very concise. But when you look at the defense, that defense is not very sound. And on the flip side, in Indiana's case, Paul George, he's working a one-man show over here and he need pieces. He needs critical pieces on top of that. Where when you look at it, honestly, Paul George, it could be easily, I'm going to stay in my contract for one more year, and then I'm gone, and I don't know where he would go. Any possible early predictions of where Paul George would go, Rory? Yeah, it's interesting so far. So, Paul George, it, it doesn't seem like he's happy there in Indiana. I know he has said he likes it, but that just doesn't seem the case on the court. And he's talked about how he needs more from the other guys around him. They brought back Lance Stevens, and Lance Stevenson is not what he used to be when he was in the Pacers uniform before. And there's always talks about maybe going him, maybe him going to the Lakers. And I think that would be great for him. They need a superstar. Paul George would be awesome over there in a Lakers uniform. And I think that's exactly what Magic Johnson needs. Yeah, that sounds absolutely phenomenal to hear to have some revigoration into the Lakers team. Having a big name like Paul George would easily put him over the top. And breaking news, honestly, we got some more leaks in the NFL schedule where the seventh week in the season, we get our Super Bowl 51 rematch against the Pats and the Falcons. And that's going to be a fun one. Yeah, you know, that is definitely going to be a fun one. It's interesting. I don't really know if the Falcons are going to be able to get back to where they were this past season. 
is are the Panthers going to reform again and be what they were two years ago? Are the Falcons going to be able to keep it up? It was a bad loss. At 28 to 3, they were up with 3 minutes and 12 seconds left to go in the third quarter. And Tom Brady, the greatest of all time, and Bill Belichick, greatest coach of all time. I'm okay with saying both of those. They are just too good, and they were too good for the Falcons on that day. I don't know if they're going to be able to re uh, bounce back this season. Yeah, honestly, I was surprised by that Super Bowl, especially on the largest out scale of a blow of a comeback and a blowout in terms of what happened in the second half. That was seemed to be the theme. If you were to give the ESPYs a theme this past year, where there were three one leads and twenty five point leads blown out of proportion in terms of who won the the championship and who you, we initially thought would have won it by the scores alone before the decisive games. And looking back at it, going off of your point, actually, Rory, I actually wrote an article on the upcoming In the Strike Zone website where I project Leonard Fournette does not go to Jacksonville, where a lot of the analysts are saying. I project he goes to Carolina and helps boost Cam Newton's, that, that team that needs a good running back who's going to be dominant on the outside and on the inside and add another viable option in terms of the wide receiving core as well. Because I feel Leonard Fournette would be a good back to replace some of the old backs that they had there when they had uh, Jonathan Stewart and D'Angelo Williams. He fits in right into that system and he could easily make a big impact like uh, Ezekiel Elliott did for the Dallas Cowboys. Wouldn't you say, Rory? Or do you think he'll go somewhere else possibly too? You know, I think that he is the most complete running back in the draft since Adrian Peterson. And that's saying a lot. Ezekiel Elliott, what a, what a player he's turned out to be, but he does run behind the best offensive line I have ever seen. So that's saying a lot there, too. I think he was phenomenal last year. I think he was the rookie of the year by far in my eyes. I don't think it was Dak Prescott at all, but I think Ezekiel Elliott was phenomenal. And Leonard Fournette saying that he's even better than Ezekiel Elliott could say a lot about what could happen. You know, I thought Todd Gurley was going to make the step last year, and I think that he's still going to fall back a little bit, and we're going to see... All these younger running backs, I know Todd Gurley's still young, but it's going to be Zeke and Leonard Fournette for years to come. And that should be a very good matchup, especially if they end up being in the same conference. We get to see them possibly every year, depending on how the teams do. And barting any trades that could shake up anything, you could even see possibly Zeke land or Zeke being in the same division with Leonard Fournette, whether it's Dallas imploding itself or Leonard Fournette looking to join the Beasts of the East. It would be actually fantastic to see all this unfold in terms of what could be an epic draft in terms of where everyone will go, considering a lot of people are looking at Chicago picking up possibly a quarterback in either Deshaun Watson or in um, Deshaun Kaiser from Notre Dame. And there's some other stuff that they're looking at, too, a possible defense of uh, Marshawn Lattimore out of Ohio State. And there's so many big pieces, including one that everyone has kind of put on the back burner because they don't know where he would fit in terms of being either a slot receiver or a running back in Christian McCaffrey, who I said, if you read the article, once the website is published, I say he's going to be in a Washington Redskins uniform because they desperately need to make a move to try to make sure that Kirk Cousins has some weapons again. They went for the younger approach. But I don't mind the younger approach as long as it's going to be productive and keep that quarterback that we desperately need to be a franchise quarterback. It is hard trying to be a franchise team without having a steady quarterback. Look at Cleveland Browns. It happens too many times. But back to our NBA playoffs. Sorry for the news break, but news happens all the time. Back to the NBA playoffs. We are looking at what is going to be a dominant series as we go through more of the series is and it's just absolutely stunning considering Golden State has an interesting matchup on their hands in the their eight seed and San Antonio going up for their competition and they look absolutely dominant to be perfectly honest but everyone's league MVP if I do say so myself in Russell Westbrook and the Thunder are showing why they are only a six-seeded team, considering if there is not a triple-double on the board for Brody, it is hard for OKC to do any damage to these other teams in the playoffs, wouldn't you say, Rory? 
Yeah, I agree, Sean. It's been an interesting year for Russell Westbrook. He is my MVP as well. He's been phenomenal. Triple double, average a triple double this year. He gets triple doubles like it's his job. He had one last night against the Rockets, and they were winning, I think, by eight points at halftime. And the Rockets, they are built around James Harden, and James Harden is definitely the runner up in the MVP race. And he is just built so well for that team that they can come back from anything. And I think that they are very engineered for a push to actually beat Golden State. And I'm, I mean, I, I think they could beat the Spurs honestly easily. And I think that's weird to say and hard to say with the Spurs playing so great. But I just think the Rockets match up so well with anybody that they could actually make it to the NBA Finals. And it's a, it's a long journey. I know they still have to win this series against Russell Westbrook and the Thunder. But I think, it's, I think last night kind of summed it up for them, and it's over. They played so well and fluently. James Harden was, was 2 of 10 with 20 points at one point. He, had, he was 16 of 16 from the free throw line, and they were able to come back and win that game. And it was just phenomenal. Their efforts on the offensive glass and offensive three-point shooting is unbelievable. Ryan Anderson, Eric Gordon, and Lou Williams are great additions to that team. Yeah, and that was absolutely a fantastic game to watch as we saw the league MVP, and without a doubt, if someone votes against Russell Westbrook, they're clearly not knowing the stats considering Brody has a triple average, a triple-double, which we have not seen in 50, 60 years from the big O, Oscar Robinson, for the Mo Milwaukee Bucks, and he leads the team considering when he does average that triple-double, he's 33-9. and nine. When you look at that record, it's clear to say why he is the most valuable player. He's the one that changes the team from being a rebuild team to a playoff team, and a lot of people, when prior to Russell Westbrook actually breaking the record, were wondering... Is he truly an MVP even though he does average that triple-double? When should give it to LeBron? Well, Michael didn't win all, the or win all the MVPs. He did win six championships, but he did not win all the MVPs. Just because you have a player that wins a generation or can be known as a generational player, you can't necessarily place the MVP always on the generational player because there are going to be players that will want to aim at being the generational player and step up their game to actually show why they deserve it as well. Considering when you look at it, Stephen Curry is actually one MVP as well, even though he's not necessarily a generational player as much as he is a very well-needed team player for that Golden State Warriors team. And looking at it, it's just phenomenal to see the, the array of talent, considering one of the stories when we get to the baseball section, I was furious over the call in Was or down in Atlanta against the Washington Nationals, where when we get to it, easily 10 inches missed. Everyone should know what I'm talking about, but looking at the playoffs, do you sense any upsets in terms of any seedings that will be a shock, like possibly a five over four or maybe a six over three? So I really think that the Bulls have a great chance to not only beat the Celtics, but actually win 4 nothing in the series. I know that's a lot. Isaiah Thomas, it really all depends on him. Can he really come out and be the guy that he was in the regular season? Not saying he hasn't been in the first two games, but we just need a little bit more and a little more clutch aspect to his game. The fact that Dwayne Wade is playing for the Chicago Bulls is incredible. You know, people thought, did he make the right decision? It came down to the Miami Heat the Bulls, and the Pacers for those last two spots in the Eastern Conference playoffs. And, you know, everyone was saying, well, I don't know, did he make the right decision? And it looks like he did. They are a tough matchup. The Cleveland Cavaliers were 0-4 against the Bulls this season. Not saying that will happen again in the playoffs because the Bulls do have to win a whole other series after the Celtics, but I do think they could potentially make it there. I think that they are definitely ones to watch. Yeah, it's going to be a great matchup to see in terms of that, considering especially what you just mentioned there. Yeah, Boston is definitely in upset territory right there to be one of the very few one seeds to actually go down to its respective eighth seed. And honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw the Washington Wizards upset the Atlanta Falcons, who, or yeah, the Atlanta Falcons. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw the Washington Wizards at the five seed 
overthrow the Atlanta Hawks in that number four seed because that's a really tightly contested matchup, especially when considering we saw the trade that Atlanta made to get rid of one of their best three-point shooters as they look to better themselves and they actually have as they made sure they got the fourth seed in the division. I think overall the best sleeper in any conference that no one's really talking about is the Toronto Raptors. Wouldn't you say, Rory? You know, I agree with you there, Sean. It's just a little hard to call the three seed the sleeper. You think that's a little uh, over dramatic, but I get what you're saying because it's a it's a heavily favored division or conference with the Cavaliers being in it. I picked the Cavaliers earlier on before the regular season even started. I picked them now. The Raptors, they're very good with Kyle Lowry back in action. He just hit the he hit the dagger the other night. I don't know how you can bet against them. The Bucks. They're a good team. It's a it's a toss up in that series. So I think they have to get past them I, first. I feel Milwaukee, even though they have done very very well, I feel there's going to be a little bit of a transition that they still need to do. Where they've got the Greek freak who is absolutely amazing to watch. I wish he was in our market to constantly watch him. But the Greek freak that anyone may not know, it's a hard name to pronounce. So I'm not even going to try to insult the man and butcher his name, but. We'll just leave it at the Greek Freak, and he just does an amazing job of what he does. Of He knows how to have great ball control, he has great court awareness, and he knows how to finish either in the shooting itself or in driving. He does an absolutely amazing job, and he does everything wonderfully on defense as well. But I feel they need some more pieces to actually be a threat and be something we haven't seen since the Big O, honestly. So... When I look at it, I do see Toronto beating the Rap or the Raptors beating the Bucks, but I do possibly sense when it comes down later into the into the play, don't know where Boston will do because if I remember the three and six seed faces the one and eight, so I feel that would be a tough one for Bo if Boston survives. I feel Toronto would upset them there. If Chicago goes on, I feel Toronto could easily take care of them, even if that becomes an upset alert, possibly. But I feel Toronto would give the best chance against Cleveland to give some upset and possibly, possibly even see their first finals action, possibly ever for this team. It'd be amazing to actually see the Raptors in the, play, in the NBA Finals go up against one of the best teams in the West, whether it be the Rockets or be the Spurs or be Golden State. Because when we looked at it halfway through the season, these teams in the West, they were already getting to close to 40 wins, and no one in the East even cracked 25 yet. It was absolutely astounding to see how much competition has raised just between everyone in the East, and it seems like everyone in the West, it's becoming more di dynasty-esque, where we haven't seen that since possibly Kobe, honestly. Wouldn't you agree with me, Rory, on that one? No, I would agree with you there, and Kobe, he was a dynasty in himself. I know he had Shaq, but when Shaq left, he was still an amazing player, and the Lakers were still as good as ever. And it's, it's incredible that we have this dynasty right now with LeBron making it to what seems to be like, a, is it his seventh straight finals this year? Um, yeah, it would be. his seventh. It's, yeah. I believe he's at seven now, and it would be his eighth because he had one before he left with Cleveland. And then he went to Just Miami. Just straight. Yeah, oh, the straight it, it would two. Be, it would be his eighth, I believe, but I, I'm pretty sure it's just his seventh. Yeah, it would yeah, be okay. his seventh, and yeah. I just just want to be on the same page there, <laughs> but it's crazy. This we have this LeBron dynasty, and now the Warriors they look uh, they look unstoppable. But it's interesting that when Kevin Durant was out, their defense actually got better, and they started to play better. They were on this huge winning streak, and then Kevin Durant came back. And it was a little clo a little more closer of a game in game one against the Trailblazers. And then game two was pretty safe and sound for the Warriors. I'm not saying that Durant's not the best player on that team because I think he is individually. But together on that team, I do think he actually brings them down a little bit. I, I would agree with you on that considering when I'm looking at this team, prior to Durant, they were very sound defensively. And then obviously when you get a big player such as Kevin Durant, I never remember talking much about Kevin Durant's defense other than if it was just, oh, one game he happened to be a very good defensive player that night. It was always the offense and how he handled himself and be almost a magic 
Michael-esque combination where he can drive it in and finish at the rim, or he can have that nice floater that Magic always put up. And being the size he was, it was not hard for him to get over anybody. The only one that he would have any trouble getting over would probably be the Hall of Famer in Yao Ming. But final predictions in terms of who wins it all, Rory? I'm personally saying that it will come down to the Rockets and the Cleveland Cavaliers. And I say the Cavs have to go seven and take out the Rockets as Cleveland picks up its second straight. Isn't it crazy that that's a bold prediction? That it really, it really is. I mean, I know it sounds bold, but it's it, it it sounds like a safe bet, but it's also bold because there's so many factors in terms of that, like. Like we were saying, the West is so dynasty-like, and the fact that the quarterfinals, you're going to have one versus three in Golden State and Houston. It's going to be a tough one to even say who wins that, but I feel Houston, like we said, with adding that Durant piece where he's not consistently a good defender, but he has good offense to back it up, I feel that it would be the real challenge of who wins the defense battles. If the team that's more complete that doesn't necessarily gave up a little bit of defense to have the better offense, I feel they could easily overturn it and have Houston in the favor in that and then still have to face the Spurs later on. But I I would go with Cleveland having to go seven against Houston and winning because the LeBron dynasty, as much as anyone that thinks a dynasty is not good for sports, it's very good for sports considering you get to see the generational players do what we project them to do. And once their career is over, we get to say we got to live in great years. Our very beginnings growing up in the 90s, we got to be a little bit of a piece of Michael Jordan, but we got a lot of Kobe Bryant. We got a lot of the beginning. And now with LeBron, our parents got to watch Bird versus Magic. And even in earlier cases where they had Will Chamberlain and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, like, it's fun to actually watch LeBron James. I used to hate him at one point, and I'm loving watching the play now, considering it's not so much, oh, I'm the superstar, I want to be treated this way. It's more, okay, I need to give back to the city, give back to the community. This is how we actually become men and respect everyone that we enjoy playing for and playing with. You know, I love the way you said that. I, I love your predictions. Uh Speaking of LeBron, you know, it's been a wild roller coaster with him. He was this phenom, phenom superstar out of high school, best high school player ever on the cover of Sports, Sports Illustrated, ESPN, everything on Sports Center all the time. Big scandal in high school, more than a game. It was a documentary about him and, and their high school years. He was this crazy guy, and he was supposed to save the world, be the next Michael Jordan. And, I'm, it's safe to say that he is close, very close to Michael, and no one thought that was going to happen. And I love being able to watch him, and, you know, the decision was his downfall, and I think that's really where his legacy drops off because of that, and I think that's what really hinders our ability to see that, is that he's such a great basketball player, but because of this one decision, it really hurt his case to be better than Michael. And, you know, I get to look past that, and now seeing him play and all – and everything he's done in, throughout his career, I can't go against him. I pick him every year. I, I just can't do it. He's that good of a player. I pick the Cavaliers over the Warriors in seven games. And I would love to pick the Rockets. I love that. It's just I can't go against the Warriors either. How do you have four superstars and not make it? It would just be uh, incredible. Well, even one of the things I have always loved in terms of a particular sports movie that I love in terms of the replacements the starters come, like, the final game to get the Washington Senators into the playoffs. They have to go against Dallas, who broke the line and come back, and all the starters that were there in the NFL actually start coming back, and they actually play in that game. But you get to see the players that truly love the game, truly want to give back to the community that they play for, and be thankful for the opportunities that they get and be able to just say, I got to play professional ball even though some people would look at that period of time and say they were nothing but a bunch of scrubs. It's a great movie to watch where you got Keanu Reeves as uh, Falco and you got uh, Gene Heckelman as the head coach and it's 
a phenomenal movie for anyone that's looking for it. But it's the passion that I see in this Houston Rockets team that I could easily see upsetting the superstars factor of Golden State, of which which is a good prediction that anyone could try to make, even if it is an uncontrollable battle where it's the immovable object versus the unresisting force, is one of those things that you just have to pick either one or the other to prevail because either way you look at it, it's a solid pick.